everyone welcome back to utility sports really excited for this video as i teased earlier in the week we have a 2023 nba mock draft this is my version 4.0 and this is the first version to actually include trades there's only a couple of trades in this video i didn't go too crazy because typically it's pretty tough to mock what is perceived as good trades and, and trades that are likely to actually happen. So I only have a couple in here. I think they're more kind of idea starters and, and discussion topics than anything. I hope you guys do enjoy this video though. If you do make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more. A lot of work goes into these videos. I've got a very tight schedule right now and I'm working really hard to make sure I'm putting out good content for you guys for this year's NBA draft, which is just a couple weeks away. So maybe smash that like button if you're excited for that as well. And let's jump into it here with the first overall pick. And I don't think this is a big surprise to anyone. Victor Wembanyama from the Metropolitans 92 is the first overall selection. I do just want to take a minute to say that I think he is the greatest prospect I've had the ability to evaluate at this point now i'm only 23 years old so it's not like i was around when lou alcinder was coming into the nba but uh, i just think realistically uh he's just so phenomenal uh, I, I don't think people understand enough how skilled this guy is for his size uh, and i think really when he reaches his full potential and kind of comes to the understanding that he can be uh, a dominant pick and roll big he can be a dominant post up big and in the right situation he can be a dominant face up big he can be a dominant ball handler that like when he lives up to all of those things he's going to be virtually unguardable just because of his pure size now i'm just hoping he stays on the floor i know people are gonna criticize and say well he's not going to be healthy he's not going to stay healthy we've never seen a player at that frame stay healthy we also haven't seen a player as i would say prim perimeter oriented at his size either which i think is a completely different ball game uh you think about some of the players that have been dominant bigs that at his size like Yao Ming for example a lot of his work did come inside now I know Yao Ming was a very talented player but I think Victor Wembanyama is just otherworldly in terms of the ball handling the perimeter shot making and he's just somebody that I think is going to light the world on fire very quickly into his career he's made this draft process so fun for me uh just having the ability and the uh the time of day to even sit around and watch this guy play is going to be awesome. I'm looking forward to watching so many Spurs games next year because of him. Spurs fans, I'm sure you feel the same way as well. And there's really not a better organization that could have gotten him, uh, quite frankly, just looking at their track record of developing big men, developing international talent as well. It's just kind of a perfect mesh and, and one that was destined to come to fruition. So really happy for the Spurs and also really happy for Victor Wembanyama who was happy that San Antonio landed the first overall pick. And I think they're going to be an awesome combination going forward, both Victor and San Antonio in very good spots moving forward. Moving on to pick number two, and this is really where the draft starts. But remember, if we flash back to about eight, nine, ten months ago, I think everyone assumed picks one and two were locks at this point, uh, given the fact that Scoot Henderson had just briefly faced Victor Wembanyama in their game back in Las Vegas. And remember, Scoot Henderson had a phenomenal showing in that one in front of all 30 NBA teams, all 30 executives, our lead GMs, uh, uh, in front of literally the entire scouting department for pretty much every single organization. They were all in attendance. And Charlotte, you would think then, would be dumb to pass on Scoot Henderson, but there's all these rumors about Brandon Miller, second overall. So the question is, who do they take? Do they take Scoot Henderson? Do they draft Brandon Miller? And there's a real divide right now. There's a lot of people who are firmly in the camp that Brandon Miller is the selection. Uh, of course, you've heard reports on that. And then there's also the people who believe Scoot Henderson should and will be the selection. And I find myself in that camp. I know people are going to say, well, all the reports point to Brandon Miller. Remember last year, all of, all of the reports pointed to Jabari Smith being the first overall pick. Remember back in the 20. 21 draft all of the reports supposedly pointed to Jalen Suggs being the fourth overall pick by the Toronto Raptors neither of those things happened and I think it's a real possibility still that Brandon Miller does not go second overall which would put us in a very unique situation for pick three which we'll talk about in a minute but I do believe Scoot Henderson and LaMelo Ball can coexist Scoot Henderson and his pre-draft workouts have been flashing pretty good shot making he's just a phenomenal perimeter talent in general 
He's going to be a player that gets to the lane uh, and gets to the rim a decent amount. And because of that, he puts a lot of stress and pressure on a defense. And off of that, he's able to kick out to the perimeter, open up a lot of other opportunities for his teammates. And I think because of that, he's going to have a really productive career as not only a scorer, which is something he's really, really good at, but also just leading an offense and being a facilitator. And I think with Charlotte, I know people are going to say, well, they have LaMelo Ball. First of all, remember back to when people said Chris Paul and James Harden wouldn't work, and then that team won 60 games and nearly made the finals had Chris Paul probably not pulled his hamstring? Like, people thought that wouldn't work. And those were two very ball-dominant players, to be honest. Chris Paul maybe a little bit less so than Harden, but still, both of them very ball-dominant. I think Scoot Henderson does get off the ball decently quickly. I think LaMelo Ball can be somebody who does spot up and find success there. Scoot Henderson has the tools and traits to be a good cutter if he buys into it. And I think at this point, everything he said in the pre-draft process points to his willingness to do what it takes to win. And I think Charlotte would be really dumb to not take Scoot Henderson second overall. Uh, they just don't really come that often as a player who... I know he's only six foot two, but he's got a six foot nine wingspan. He's got defensive traits that make you think that if you lock him in and and coach him up, he's going to be a good defender. Uh, and just the overall feel, playmaking. I think everyone keeps talking about Brandon Miller's playmaking, and they're assuming it's on the level of Scoot Henderson. It's not even close. Brandon Miller, at the end of the day, if his development goes perfectly, he probably gets close to where Scoot Henderson currently is as a passer. And I think that's just uh, one of the reasons why I think Charlotte should and ultimately will take Scoot Henderson, which is what I'm mocking. This is not what I would do. This is what I think the organization does. And I still think that Scoot Henderson is the second overall pick. Moving into the third overall selection, now we have the Portland Trailblazers here. And this is where things get interesting. Of course, a lot of people are going to instantly assume, well, if Scoot Henderson's off the board, clearly the Portland Trailblazers would then pivot and take Brandon Miller although I'm not sure if that's as likely especially given some of the circumstances first of all Brandon Miller there are, is some character concerns around him because of the situation that involved his teammate back at Alabama and then some celebrations and pregame rituals those kinds of things I do think require answers and on top of that for a multi-million dollar investment there are just other concerns as well and Portland also has not had him in the building yet where they have publicly basically announced on their social media pages both Scoot Henderson's workout with the team and Amen Thompson's workout with the team. And if you look back to last year, Portland clearly a team that likes to draft off of upside under Joe Cronin's first year in the draft, selected Shaden Sharp, who hadn't even played a college game uh, at that point when they drafted him and they felt comfortable and clearly the athletic traits were something that they considered so why not go and get arguably the most athletic player in the draft in Amon Thompson who is six foot five and three quarters without shoes making him a solid six foot seven with shoes on and by the way he jumps out of the gym he is about as fluid as water laterally he can change his hips and, and flip them and change directions with a live handle he's a phenomenal dump off passer the best alley-oop passer in the draft and that might not sound like a lot, but I do think it is, especially given the fact that he would now be teammates with Shaden Sharp, who is cleared for takeoff at all times. Portland, third overall. This might be a shock to everybody, but I think this is significantly more likely than other people are considering currently. I think everyone's kind of locked into, oh, Amon Thompson will go fourth. I think this draft, specifically the top, if Brandon Miller does not go second overall, will lead to a lot of surprises. And it'll leave a lot of people shocked in ways that they currently are not. And I think because of that, Amon Thompson would be not only a very good addition to Portland, who, yes, maybe this is a little clunky to start because they do have Dame, Simons, and Shaden Sharp. Where does he exactly fit? The reality, reality is Portland, their front office has a lot of long-term security. They're going to draft off of upside. They're going to draft off of who they believe could be the best three, four, five years from now. And Amon Thompson has legitimate claims to all of those things. And I think his athleticism... I, I mean, it popped. I know it popped in their pre-draft workouts for my intel. And it left a lasting impression on the organization. I'm going to leave it that way. I think Amon Thompson third overall to Portland is very much so in play. I think even if Scoot Henderson uh, was available, it would be at least a consideration. Although I do think that currently Scoot Henderson would be the lead candidate if he's available for Portland at three. But ultimately, I feel like the B Portland Trailblazers are sticking here in the draft. I don't see them trading out of this selection. And I think they're going to take a guy like Amon Thompson, who 
I believe they're in the process of falling in love with. Pick number four, we have the Houston Rockets now, and I'm sure Rockets fans are kind of biting their fingernails. No Scoot Henderson, no Amen Thompson. What is he going to throw at us? Is it going to be Cam Whitmore out of Villanova? Could it be Brandon Miller out of Alabama? And that's the latter one I landed on. Brandon Miller here goes fourth overall, and I do think the talent level is just too severe to pass on him at number four if you're Houston. And I think this lines up with some of their potential offseason goals as well, where we know Ime Udoka and the entire organization is looking to add a variety of different big men to their lineup behind Alperen Shangun. They have the cap space to go out and do that. There's going to be a variety of bigs out there in free agency that they could potentially target. And of course, the James Harden to Houston rumors have been circulating for quite some time. I am very much in the camp that believes he will be playing for the Houston Rockets next season and I do think it makes sense for them to go that direction because he would be a significant upgrade as a table setter for Jalen Green, Jabari Smith Jr., Alperen Shangun on short rolls. I think just overall the whole team would be placed in better situations and they'd find a lot more productivity quickly while there's pressure still on the organization, specifically the front office and GM Raphael Stone to turn this thing around and start winning as Tillman Fertitta kind of gave them a, hey, let's start winning here pretty soon because they wanted a three-year window of this rebuild. Those three years are up. The Rockets have pressure on them. And adding in a guy who averaged 19 points a game as a freshman in college definitely does go a long way as well. Helping that process of kind of turning the corner into a team that's more competitive right now, ready to win. James Harden's addition would go a long way in doing that. But also, you look at the actual talent on the floor. They're able to space it. Jabari Smith Jr. still a very good shooter, despite the shooting splits maybe not suggesting that from year one. I think realistically, you get a good floor general next to him and James Harden. Brandon Miller and Jabari Smith Jr. are going to be walking into a lot of open shots, and they've got the skill set to knock them down. Plus, they've got tantalizing length on the wing, where as a 3-4 combo, oh my goodness, they're going to overwhelm a lot of teams. You've got two legitimate 6'9 and 6'10 forwards playing alongside each other in Houston for the long term with an intriguing athletic Score, scoring, shot-creating threat in Jalen Green. And, of course, one of the better young bigs in the league in Alperen Sengun, who's extremely talented. I think the Rockets' future is very, very bright, to be honest, especially if Brandon Miller falls to them at four and they sign James Harden. I think it helps them take a big step forward now, giving their guys a lot of good repetitions and, and good, meaningful games to compete in and kind of setting the tone of this is what Rockets basketball is supposed to look like. We're going to be competitive. We're going to fight. We're going to try and win. That's something the Rockets haven't been able to do the last three years since trading Harden. His return to the franchise would mark a, a big pivot that I think that they need. And the Rockets would be heading in the right direction once again, especially adding Brandon Miller fourth overall. Now, as we move into pick number five, we do have the Detroit Pistons here. And the Pistons are a very tough team to mock it's ever since they fell down to five. There's been like real concerns about, okay, first of all, who could they take? What would it look like? How does it fit into their roster? And I think every single week I'm like, I don't know. And I feel like I keep switching my mind on it because I just, the Pistons are just really difficult for me. They haven't been very public about their free draft workouts. I'm not as certain on who's been in and out of the building as I have been with other teams like Houston, like Indiana, like Portland, for example. And because of that, the Pistons are a little bit cloudier for me. This time around, I mocked Cam Whitmore, who I think is kind of emerging back into that top five conversation for a lot of people. For me, the comparison that I like for him as a draft prospect is Jalen Brown. I think their body types are similar, similar height. Now, I think Cam Whitmore, a bigger, stronger body, which is a big plus. He leverages his shoulders very well as a driver. He knows how to use uh, his body to duck in on cuts, and uh, he's very good at face cutting and, and doing a lot of the things that you have to do off the ball which makes him a very good fit next to Cade Cunningham. But also just out of the triple threat, he's got a blazing first step. I think him and Jaden Ivey would be a really intriguing duo because both of them can just put so much pressure on the rim as either a guard or a wing. Of course, respectively, Ivey as a guard and Whitmore as the wing. But I think just overall, the physical profile is there. That suggests Cam Whitmore would be a really good addition to a team that I think just needs more actual talent. And uh, specifically on the wing, you think about some of the young bigs this team has, some of the young guards this team has. They're kind of missing that like really powerful 
well-developed wing, and I think Cam Whitmore is the guy that could turn into that. And there are some concerns, very similar to Jalen Brown, some of those concerns that he had coming out of Cal and really hasn't improved on as much in the NBA as I would have liked, which is specifically downhill playmaking. I want to see Cam Whitmore take strides there. I really believe that he needs to to become the best version of himself that he can be because right now he kind of gets tunnel vision as a driver, ends up losing the ability to drive and kick, whether that's to the strong uh, side corner, which is the easy passes to make. He even misses those at times, but also to the weak side, you almost have to bet that he's not going to make those passes. And that's an area of development that he needs to take strides in. I thought about with Monty Williams there, what does Detroit look to do? I found a lot of different thoughts in my head that rationalized a lot of different positions. I thought Osar Thompson. I thought maybe Jairus Walker. I thought even about Taylor Hendricks, but ultimately I landed on Cam Whitmore because I think the positional need is a little bit bigger. And I think Troy Weaver has this in mind of guys that could fit their roster. And positionally, Cam Whitmore fits the bill in terms of the physicals, the athleticism, and the upside long-term. Pick six now, we have the Orlando Magic, a team that I thought about a lot of trades for in this mock, but I just couldn't really land on one that I loved. Because of that, I had them stay pat because they have pick six and pick 11. I think there's a lot of talent out here for them to go and add to their currently good and young roster. And the first guy I landed on here was Jairus Walker. One thing about this Orlando Magic front office is since trading Nikola Vucevic and Aaron Gordon and Evan Fournier away, I think which is the biggest pivot point of the franchise's recent history, you're looking at this team as kind of a a team loaded with a lot of wing talent. They've been kind of hoarding the wing talent, specifically when you look at Franz Wagner, Paulo Boncaro, those are, of course, the two top end examples on the team of that. And they're always kind of in the market to add more size, strength, and versatility. And that's what Jairus Walker offers. Uh, I think he's a really talented player. He's got ball skills, able to put the ball in the deck. He's got a nice shot uh, that he can stretch out to the three-point line a bit. Now, I think his best version of himself is knocking down a bunch of mid-range jump shots which maybe doesn't necessarily solve some of Orlando's three-point uh, deficiencies and their just overall lack of full court spacing now I think Jairus Walker is a talented player that probably will be able to stretch out to the NBA three-point line at some point which is what you're kind of banking on here with this selection if you're Orlando but one thing about this team is they have a lot of defensive versatility and they're adding to that here with a player who at about six foot eight with 240 pound frame He's big, strong, and physical, but he's got really surprising foot speed that I think for a, for most prospects, you hear, oh, this guy's 240 pounds. You're not thinking the most laterally quick player. Jairus Walker is very laterally quick for his size, and I think he does a good job leveraging his frame and, and using his hips and, and shoulders to stay in front of guys and keep his chest in front of players. I think he's got traits that could make him a, a solid help defender as well. And because of that, Orlando feels very good about taking him here and just continuing to add to their overall construction of talented big wings who can defend and pass a bit and and knock down shots and that's what they're getting here uh, again with Jairus Walker moving on to pick number seven we have the Indiana Pacers who have had three 2023 NBA draft prospects in their facility for individual workouts they've worked out a whole bunch of guys second round level players first round level players but for this top pick they've had three guys specifically in their building for individual workouts where it's just them, Rick Carlisle, and some of the coaching staff. Those three players, Cam Whitmore, off the board, Jairus Walker, off the board, and Taylor Hendricks, who is now an Indiana Pacer in this mock draft. I think it's a phenomenal fit. In fact, if you ask me one of my favorite fits from this mock draft, I would say Taylor Hendricks to Indiana is right up there. I would have also loved Cam Whitmore here. I think that you could argue either of them as great options. But Taylor Hendricks, to me, is a really, really good addition because I think next to Miles Turner, who's already a block machine, one of the highest volume block uh, shot blockers in the NBA right now, I think that you're adding another guy who can protect the rim, gives you a lot of defensive versatility, and something that, realistically, Rick Carlisle hasn't had a ton of in his uh, most recent tenures as a head coach, where typically he doesn't have a lot of size, shot blocking, athleticism on the back line. Of course, Miles Turner's done that for him since his return to Indiana. And I think Taylor Hendricks would be another great addition to that kind of mold and and that kind of build to their defense. But I also think that for Indiana, the specific shooting ability that Taylor Hendricks possesses, where he shot over 39% from three, he's a fantastic 
catch and shoot player specifically out of the corner. I think he's going to continue to grow as an above the break three point shooter as well. Uh, as he gets into the NBA, he's got a lot of touch as a perimeter shooter. Now I, I want to see that touch play itself out around the rim. I think that's a kind of point on his concentration level as a finisher. But the one thing this guy does finish is above the rim. And I think next to Tyrese Halliburton, you want more athleticism, more like physical dominance. And that's exactly what Taylor Hendricks embodies here as a really strong, great athlete. I just think Indiana, you're getting something you need, which is more shot blocking, a little bit more rim protection, defensive versatility, and, and a hybrid defender who can guard out in space, but also just does a great job as a help site guy. I think probably becomes somewhat of a small ball five long term. For Indiana, you think about some of their currently existing bigs, like a Jalen Smith, who has some perimeter skill set as well. You have some intriguing lineup options. Of course, Turner can step out and knock him down from behind the arc. Really, Indiana could pivot from a kind of five-out offense to a four-out offense. They could run some pick and rolls with Hendricks being a screen and roll guy. Of course, Turner can screen and pop. You can have a, a bunch of different actions uh, off of that, whether that's horns or you could run some Spain looks, of course. I, I just think overall, Indiana would have a lot of versatility, which would be really good for Rick Carlisle. And I think overall, uh, Hendricks was impressive in his pre-draft process and his pre-draft workout with the Indiana Pacers. And because of that, I think he could be a, a home run selection for them, seventh overall, a player that I really love. And I think the Pacers would be really happy to have. Pick number eight, we move on to the Washington Wizards now. And the Wizards, really a tough team to kind of mock currently because there's a lot of reports about Michael Winger what he could potentially look to do according to reports rival execs think he could tear this whole thing down let Kristaps Porzingis go maybe try and facilitate some type of sign and trade for either him or Kyle Kuzma we'll see maybe he tries to facilitate a Bradley Beal uh, trade on draft night which I think would be really good for that organization if they're able to pull that off Wizards fans probably sad to see Beal go but I think it would be good for their long-term direction because I think this team just really in a tough spot. Corey Kispert's a good shot maker. I like Denny Avdia. I think those are the two long-term players I would trust as like not necessarily building blocks, but players I would like to have for the next eight to 10 years, even if they're not necessarily my focus players. I think they're great role players and contributors around talent. And I think if you're taking a swing on talent, Osar Thompson from the City Reapers Overtime Elite makes a lot of sense because of some of the physical traits that he has. And I think defensively, he could perhaps grow into a very good player. Now, part of the reason to make this selection is I don't think Osar Thompson is very ready to impact winning on the highest level quite yet. And that's okay. I think he's going to have flashes and moments because he has talent. He's athletic. I think he's going to be a phenomenal transition player early in his career. The shot making kind of comes and goes, but it's been a little bit more productive than Amon Thompson up to this point. And there is some ball handling capabilities that he has showcased moment at like in moments. It's not been strung, strung together. It's not like he's a pick and roll ball handler yet at this point that you'd 100% trust to put the ball in his hands at the end of a game. But I think he's flashed in a variety of ways that at least draws you in as an interested person to kind of see how his career pans out. And I think for Washington, if they do end up going for that kind of rebuild and long-term retool, drafting Osar Thompson, you're not really concerned about the year one results. You're more so focused on his long-term development, which I think is really good for this organization. And similar to how they were kind of reliant on getting the first overall pick for John Wall on uh, how he kind of transformed that franchise for the 2010s, I think that really Osar Thompson could be the beginning of that where we see this team take a big step back right now, but it's really good for them long-term because maybe Osar Thompson kind of develops and reaches his stride right as some of these other future picks they're going to make hit their strides as well. And perhaps Washington finds themselves in a position where they're not adding just one really good player in the draft, but maybe two, three, four, or five of them. And because of that, the Wizards are in a completely different situation and one that is really advantageous for them long-term. Pick number nine, we have the Utah Jazz here now, and I thought about a lot of Utah Jazz trades too in this video, specifically looking at picks 16 and 28 as potential move-up options to get in at maybe pick 10 or 11. I thought about all of them. I have one up on the channel in my most recent NBA Draft Night Trades that are possible video that's on the channel. I would recommend checking that one out after this mock, but in this mock, I did not land on any Utah Jazz trades, but ninth overall, I just had them take a really good player and Danny Ainge, one of the guys that I know is just smart and would make the right selection. Now, I don't think Kaysen Wallace is off the table here at nine either. I think Utah would strongly consider him as well. 
but I think just the overall size, Anthony Black is about three and a half inches taller than Kaysen Wallace, who only measured about six foot two without shoes on, which I think is a red flag for some teams. It's not like he's tiny, but he's definitely not big. He does have a, a nice wingspan, but Anthony Black does as well. And Anthony Black is one of the most versatile players in this year's draft uh, because he's a good connector offensively. He can run a pick and roll for you. He's an intuitive cutter. He's a phenomenal transition player, both with and without the ball in his hands. And I also think defensively, he's one of the smarter players, one of the more active players with his ability to get his hands on the basketball as a help side guy. Uh, he does a very good job kind of influencing drives both on and off the ball as well, whether that's kind of cheating in and uh, disrupting a, a straight line drive or uh, riding the hip of a player that he is defending as the primary guy. He does a good job in both of those situations. And I think for Utah, it's not it's less about fit for them because it's just about, hey, can we get more good talent in the, in the door? And I think Anthony Black is definitely good talent. I know some people are questioning the shot making right now, and I think those are some fair criticisms. But overall, when you have a player who's really smart and understands what's supposed to happen on a basketball court, it goes a long way in influencing winning. And I think that, Ultimately, for Utah, being able to draft somebody who's just flat out good at basketball, I think is a home run because it's going to make their team better now. He does fit, even though I said that, look, they're not valuing fit more than talent. I think this is like the perfect blend of the talent makes sense at nine, the fit makes sense at nine. And because of that, it's just like a surefire pick. If he's here for the Utah Jazz, I think that they do select him on draft night. Moving on to pick 10, and we actually do have a trade to announce. The Dallas Mavericks and Brooklyn Nets have agreed to a deal for this video. The Mavericks received pick 21, pick 22, and pick 51. So two first round picks in this year's draft and a late second round pick as well, kind of as a sweetener to convince the Mavericks to make this deal. And the Brooklyn Nets are actually the team that moves up to pick 10 in what is, I think, a surprising change of events. But if you kind of think about some of the things the Nets were lacking, from this most recent season, it's going to make some sense when we discuss who the actual selection is. But for Dallas specifically, a team that is really needy for more young talent, I think sticking at 10, even though I, I think there's a lot of talent in the lottery this year, and you can look at yourself and say, we could get a really good player. I don't think the Mavericks are in a position where they can afford to only walk out of this draft with just like one swing on a guy. I think realistically having two or three swings like you get in this trade, with three opportunities to draft players would go a long way in kind of moving the needle for the Dallas Mavericks and giving them the pathway to go out, improve, and take big steps forward that help this team win. You could argue maybe this isn't enough value for Dallas. Maybe it's too much value for Brooklyn. I tried to make this as close and competitive as possible as an offer and I think realistically moving down 11 spots you also pick up 22 and 51 it's a pretty good deal for both sides because the Brooklyn Nets come in here now with the 10th overall pick via that trade with Dallas and they go with Derek Lively the second out of Duke who is a big time riser currently in the draft community a lot of people discussing his pro days I think a lot of league executives were pretty impressed with his showing especially the touch behind the three-point line but I think realistically the most important thing is kind of the rim presence that he would provide for Brooklyn specifically when Nick Claxton is not on the floor and I think that was a big issue for Brooklyn this past season I I just think they did not rebound the ball very well of course Jacques Vaughn talked about in seemingly every single post-game press conference uh, and just seemingly was not happy at all with the activity level and the uh, willingness to hit the glass for the Nets this past year. Derek Lively is going to do those things per 40 minutes. He averaged over 10 rebounds a game uh, for Duke in that stretch. And he also per 40 minutes was averaging nearly five blocks in those 40 minutes. So he's a really productive player in the minutes that he received. Now there are going to be some concerns about foul trouble. Can he stay on the floor? I think one of the few teams that don't have to worry about that is the Brooklyn Nets because you do have a guy who is arguably going to be a defensive player of the year candidate in Nick Claxton, a player that I've really liked for a long time. I think now you're surrounding him with another guy that addresses a big need that Jacques Vaughn sees on the team. Of course, they've signed him in as the long-term head coach of the organization, and you want to see him succeed. And I think going up and getting uh, one of the better bigs in a very thin center class does make some sense. I think that's really the whole point of making a trade up is if the Nets don't then you're kind of waiting on a center and you're not really sure what kind of results you're going to get out of anyone else Derek Lively is clearly in my opinion the second best center in this year's draft 
He's a massive human being with a, a big wingspan who I think can impact shots out on the uh, out in the lane, specifically around the rim. And I think he's going to have a, a really nice career, especially if he gets to kind of learn his way into the NBA behind Nick Claxton for a little while. Pick 11, the Orlando Magic back on the clock at this spot. After going with Jairus Walker and adding some really good forward talent, they're going to take another big swing on upside on a player that has gained a lot of steam over the last three or four weeks as the Metropolitans 92 have been playing in their playoffs in the LNB Pro A League, which I've had a very close eye on and I've had a lot of fun watching those games. Bilal Koulibaly has really been playing his best basketball down the stretch of the season here. He had a very productive season where he shot over 50% from the field, uh, above 40% from three, and, and just all in all, the skills are really what flash to me when I watch him. Uh, speci specifically, my favorite thing is his stride length. He gets downhill in a hurry, and he provides a different kind of athleticism than some of the other players because he's not necessarily like blazing quick or the fastest guy, but it just seems like every single step he takes, he actually goes somewhere with it, and he has like really good functional athleticism, not necessarily that he jumps out of the gym or, again, that he's the fastest guy, but he just uses the athleticism that he does have to create advantage. And that's really the whole point of basketball is can you in five on five situations create advantage for yourself in one, some way or another? And I think for him going around and playing next to Apollo Boncaro and a Franz Wagner, and in this case, a Jairus Walker, he'd be a really nice addition because he can knock down open shots. He would be a nice positive addition to Orlando from his three point shooting perspective. Now I think maybe he's not as good of a three point shooter as some of the other snipers in this draft but that's okay because he does give you some other things. I think defensively, he's a really smart player. He's played in a lot of unique and I think challenging systems. Just the fact that he's playing professional basketball right now in a very competitive league that has a lot of uh, different X's and O's that the NBA maybe doesn't even lean into as much like full court pressing, a little bit more zone usage. I think because of that, he's been tasked mentally. I think he's had a lot of tough challenges. Uh, in terms of learning the mental part of the game. And he's been a, a guy that they've relied on for the Metropolitans 92. They've even put the ball in his hands quite a bit in the postseason, more so than they did in the regular season, which kind of shows that uh, their coach over there, uh, Colette, really trusts him as a uh, decision maker and as a guy to, at some points, take them home when they need him to. He's done that. I think Orlando takes the huge swing on upside and something that probably does pay off pretty well for them just with their recent track record of development. I think Bilal Koulibaly could be on a, a real pathway to being a great player in the NBA. Pick 12 now, the Oklahoma City Thunder on the clock, and I've had real difficulties with this pick in recent weeks. I've mocked a bunch of different things. I've gone player A, player B, player C, player D with them, and I don't try to do that, but I think sometimes my indecision shows exactly my comfortability level with the team because uh, not necessarily that I don't know about them. I definitely do. But like I think there's a lot of ways Oklahoma City could go. And I think that shows how versatile their situation is, which is exactly what they're supposed to be because it's it's good when you have options. Like some teams have like such obvious needs that you're like, oh my gosh, they need to address this. Oklahoma City has a few needs, but they're, some of them are going to be solved by Chet Holmgren coming back. I trust Jalen Williams as a backup big out of Arkansas. I trust the other Jalen Williams as an awesome point of attack defender. I trust Josh Giddy as a ball handler decision maker. I trust Shea Gilders Alexander as a superstar. This team is loaded with young talent. And for them, it's really, which way do you want to go? Because you could go with a Leonard Miller and kind of address that power forward spot for like the traditional sense of, hey, let's get a big athletic rebounder in here who's been productive. Uh, especially in the last 12 months, or you could go with kind of some shooting and space out the floor, just looking at how well Isaiah Joe played for them. When you watch the film, Isaiah Joe had such a good year, and it's because of how many driving kick type of players Oklahoma City has, a very smart cerebral form of basketball there. And I thought, let's add another one of those guys. Grady Dick out of Kansas, he just would be so awesome for them. Another sniper, like I was talking about with Isaiah Joe. And I think this is a significantly better sniper. Not necessarily that he's a better shooter than Isaiah Joe. I think Isaiah Joe is one of the better shooters, honestly, in the league. Very underrated player in general. But I think that Grady Dick, he does more than just shoot. And I think that's kind of the separating factor here for me from him, for a guy like him compared to, uh, say that Isaiah Joe comparison. Because Isaiah Joe, yes, he can attack closeouts a little bit, but... He does a little bit less out of those, whereas Grady Dick's got a, a very advanced mid-range pull-up jump shot right now. I think his frame is significantly better than Isaiah Joe's. He gives you a little bit more length. Uh, and I think just overall, his athleticism is very slept on. 
I think he's got a pretty good functional athleticism that lets him be an NBA level talent. It's not like he's going to be completely outworked in the NBA when it comes to the athletic side of the game. I think he's going to be competitive there and he's got the skill set to do a lot of nice things in the half court. Now, I think from the playmaking perspective, one thing that I talked about how good Oklahoma City's been there, I think there is going to be some need for growth from Grady Dick. Uh, but I do think just a spaced court and uh, a very smart team game, he's going to be the player that can pay off a lot of those driving kicks. And I think realistically gives Oklahoma City another threat from behind the three-point line. So if they get down in games, you can probably have Isaiah Joe and Grady Dick out on the floor at the same time and say, okay, good luck guarding us. And then there's also times where, hey, if Isaiah Joe's not having a good night or you just kind of want to go with maybe just a better version of that, Grady Dick's the option here. And that's why I really like it for Oklahoma City. Again, I strongly consider Leonard Miller, but I just, I couldn't land on it in this mock. And because of that, I landed with Grady Dick instead. Pick number 13, the Toronto Raptors here now at this spot. And the Raptors, I've liked a lot of different guards for them. Uh, specifically, the one I've liked the most has been Kaysen Wallace. But I am making an adjustment in this mock to Kobe Bufkin, who I think the potential is a little bit higher. I also strongly consider Kobe Bufkin to the Oklahoma City Thunder because I think his relationship with Shea Gilgis Alexander, which has emerged uh, within the last couple of weeks and months, has been uh, something that's worth noting. I think his player profile as a collegiate player comparatively to Shea Gilgis Alexander is something that is very intriguing to me. Now, does he reach an SGA level stratosphere? Maybe not. Probably not, I would say, but I think he's got a very good talent uh, level that I think would fit very well in Toronto. And in fact, something I think they need a little bit more of, if you just look at it from the perspective of, hey, maybe the Raptors lose Van Vliet and they can get a different type of guard in there. I think Kobe Bufkin is the one that checks all of those boxes off because he's a competitive defender. He does a good job defending out in space and, and being able to ride a guy's hips and impact the basketball as a point of attack defender, but he's also got the athleticism to be productive as a help guy uh, in certain situations. I wouldn't say all the time, but in certain situations. And I also think uh, he's got the shot that he can, he knocks down open shots. That's uh, obviously a big concern for a lot of teams. He does that. He connects, he makes quick decisions. He can pass, he can handle in the pick and roll. He's just all in all a good player and somebody that I think a lot of teams in the lottery do have on their radar. And I think the Raptors, would be a very good team for him to land on. I think they've got the infrastructure around right now to help him develop. And I think he could be a starting level player for them in year one of his career, which is very tough to have from a point guard position. Very difficult to be a starting level player at that spot as a rookie. I think that Kobe Bufkin is somebody who's smart enough. He's experienced enough as a sophomore in college, not just a true freshman, that I, I would trust him. To maybe make that adjustment to the NBA and make it quickly enough where the Raptors could rely on him, maybe even by opening night. And if not opening night, maybe a month into the season, maybe sooner. I like that a lot for the Raptors here, and that's why I settled with him 13th overall. At 14 now, the New Orleans Pelicans here, they have a pretty loaded roster. So currently, I felt like it was best for the Pelicans to sit in at 14 and maybe take a swing on upside or just pure talent. And I went with a guy who just has talent he's a very good player and i could see honestly playing a lot of minutes for new orleans pretty quickly kind of like what we saw from dyson daniels last year of course ended up having some of those minutes reduced by the end of the season but kind of in december a little bit of november dyson daniels was playing a significant amount of minutes and i think case and wallace could find himself in a similar situation with new orleans where like they're like wow we kind of really like this kid we want him to play quite a bit because he's just a winner and i think new orleans a team that they haven't won a playoff series since trading anthony davis they barely won any playoff series with anthony davis realistically they're itching in that organization to start winning and i think they have the pieces to win of course zion williamson has a little bit of controversy around him right now but i think on the court the product is there the team is there the team is ready to win and make some moves and make some noise to get there and i think case wallace is one of those players that could help them get to that spot i just every time i watch case wallace i just fall more and more in love with the little things that he does just like kind of the instincts that he has defensively he plays off of two feet with pretty good balance offensively it just doesn't really feel too often like he forces stuff either now there's been moments of it right every single freshman in college has a moment where he forces something and it just doesn't work out very well but i think he just plays a good contained pace and, and style that I can see translating very well to the NBA despite some of those frame 
concerns at only six foot two without shoes, which is partially why he fell down to 14 in this mock. For me, I think he realistically is a top 11, 12 talent probably in this draft. I have him at 14 because of some of the physicals and some of the concerns around that. But if you look at New Orleans currently, they actually have a lot of wings. They have a decent number of bigs. I think that they could definitely get away with a smaller player. And Casey Wallace is one that he plays way bigger than he even is listed at. Moving on to pick 15 now, we have the Atlanta Hawks here. And the Hawks are a team that they need in addition to their offense. And I know that kind of sounds crazy to think because you think, oh, well, Trey Young, DeJounte Murray, the offense shouldn't really be the problem. They also have DeAndre Hunter. They've got all these pieces, right? But I think, like, when you're actually looking at the X's and O's and kind of from a coaching perspective, if you asked me what I wanted to run for Atlanta right now, my preferred answer would be, hey, Trey Young, how about we run off of some stagger screens? But then you realize Trey Young doesn't really like to do that very much. And it's not a knock on him. He's a phenomenal pick and roll ball handler. And he's so good at it that you can rationalize doing it all the time, which I think is good. But then because of that, you're going to want some players who have off ball capabilities. And that's why I landed here for the, I believe, third week, maybe fourth week in a row on Jordan Hawkins, 15th overall. I think, you know, maybe New Orleans would consider him at 14. I think 14 is probably the starting point for him in the draft. I would be surprised to see him go earlier unless somehow Toronto falls in love with him. But seemingly Masai Ujiri never drafts shooting. So I would be kind of surprised by it. 15th here, though, Atlanta just is like the spot that just makes the most sense. I think they really badly missed Kevin Herter this past year, more so than I was expecting. In fact, I, I thought that moving off of Kevin Herter in the uh, wake of the DeJounte Murray trade, I thought their offense was going to be just fine and there wasn't going to be any concerns there. For me, I was wrong. Kevin Herter was really pivotal to them, and I think that I kind of overlooked uh, some of the issues with getting rid of him. And I think for Sacramento, Herter was awesome. And I think because of that, Hawkins, who I think has a pretty low ceiling, honestly, I think he's going to be an off-ball player and that's about it. Atlanta is one of the few teams that actually makes sense to add that because with A.J. Griffin, another good perimeter shooter who can attack closeouts, I think Jordan Hawkins, you just need him for the off-ball movement, the shooting capabilities, and the touch around DeJounte Murray and Trey Young. And because of that, I think this is actually a really good pick for them, even though I'm lower on Jordan Hawkins than most. I can definitely rationalize the value here for them uh, as a player who he's really, really good off the ball. And because of that, that's one of those things that I just would say this is all you need because he just does a lot of great stuff that way and I, I just feel feel really confident about this uh, fit and this pick with the Atlanta Hawks pick 16 now the Utah Jazz at this spot after their trades last offseason Rudy Gobert being sent to Minnesota is what ultimately landed them this selection as well as a, a bevy of other picks of course and Walker Kessler and some other pieces in that deal too which we don't have to expand on too much more but this is the opportunity for Utah here to take a big swing on a guy who was previously looked at as a top 10 player in this year's draft and just did not have the freshman season to back it up for Arkansas and it's actually the second Arkansas guard we've seen the Utah Jazz select in this mock after they went with Anthony Black ninth overall they followed up with Nick Smith Jr., a player that I think does have some intriguing traits and some tantalizing upside if you look at it that way. And if you watch the highlights, you're going to become a big time believer in this kid because some of the shots he makes, some of the feel for the game that it seems like he possesses, you can definitely buy into. Now, I do think there are some serious flaws, and I think one of those is the availability and some of the injury concerns he's had. Of course, kind of dealt with a knee injury that really rattled his season. From the beginning, I don't think it's very fair to Nick Smith Jr. to completely put all of your weight into his loan season for the Razorbacks. I think you have to go back to his high school film to really see who he is as a player and what he's flashed on actual film. And I, I think when you do that, it's a really healthy process uh, just to go through that. I, I, for every player, I've watched them all in high school. It's just it's how I am. I'm a basketball guru. I'm a basketball nut. And because of that, I have to literally spend my entire life consuming basketball for the most part uh and I, I like watching Nick Smith Jr. now I do have some concerns about if that potential is something he's ever going to live up to I see a little bit too much D'Angelo Russell for me to be in love with him as a prospect honestly um but I do think the talent is there again the touch is really the thing that draws you into him I think from a mid-range and three-point shooting perspective he has the touch and the shot making upside to sell you especially if he has good workouts with teams and I think Utah one of those teams that would be willing to take a stab with how many selections they have 
if Nick Smith Jr. ends up hitting here, they feel like geniuses. And if he doesn't hit, they don't even feel that bad because they have so many more selections coming in the future that it's really worth the the shot if you feel like he could become something in Utah's the team here in this mock that I rationalized having the wherewithal to take that type of gamble. Pick 17, and we actually have another trade to announce. The Pacers here receive pick 17, and the Lakers receive picks 26 and 32. This is pretty similar to a deal we saw a few years ago where the Oklahoma City Thunder moved up to, I believe, pick 18 for picks 25 and 28, but they also uh, had to give up a second round pick in that. So this has been altered a little bit. Instead of moving up to 18 for 25 and 28, this team moves up for 20 uh, from 26 and 32 to 17. And there's also just uh, not a second round pick involved in it. So a little bit more expensive in terms of the initial picks, but no second rounder um, in addition to those other two picks. So it's a little bit different. Uh, and I think because of that, it's a realistic trade and one that I could see the Lakers making because similar to Dallas, I think they're desperate for a little bit more youth and, and young depth that they could use for kind of looking at the long-term future. They do owe a decent number of picks out the door already. So the more picks they can have, the better. They're only moving down nine spots here and picking up a top 32 selection in the draft, which could be very valuable for them. And the Pacers, they're the team that, hey, they came into this draft with five for uh, five total picks. Uh, I believe two second rounders, three first rounders. They still possess three first rounders after making this deal. They still have pick 29 after 17 now, and they're in a position to improve their roster while still only sacrificing one pick. So they still have four total picks in this draft, even after making this deal. And at 17, I feel very confident about this being a player that the Pacers could potentially look to move up and draft. And it's one of the few players that they've had in a group workout that actually, to me, looks like a first-round level player, and that's Leonard Miller from G League Ignite. They've had him in workouts, specifically facing guys who had second-round grades across a lot of different kind of draft outlets. I think most people would look at the players that they've had in the building as second-round level players. Now, they've started to bring in a few more first-round level guys uh, towards the end of this process, but Leonard Miller really stuck out to me as a guy that makes a lot of sense there. For Indiana, of course, we already did go with Taylor Hendricks earlier on, but let's get more size. And I think the skill set that Leonard Miller possesses is vastly different than Taylor Hendricks because Taylor Hendricks kind of that typical 3 and D rim protection, even though they're kind of quote unquote play the same position, which doesn't really even exist in today's NBA anymore. They're very different actual players. Leonard Miller has a history as a point guard, point forward type uh, when he was playing for Team Canada, as well as his prep school. Uh, that he used to play for before going to the G League Ignite. He was a really intriguing passer. Now, he's very turnover prone, uh, something that I don't think you can put the ball in his hands frequently, but on a short roll, can you hit him and you'll make the right pass? I think that's a, a good possibility, which I think would be unique and dynamic next to Tyrese Halliburton there in Indiana. I also think outside of that, this guy just hoards rebounds, averaged over three offensive rebounds a game for, Indi or for, G for the G League Ignite program, excuse me, last year and then also just 11 rebounds in general he was one of the most productive players we've seen for the g league ignite he's got phenomenal size to him at six foot nine and a quarter without shoes on he's going to be a near six foot 11 player as a forward and he moves really well the three point shots a little up and down shot about 32 percent from three this past season but i think that's an improvement from where he was anyway and i think the further we get He's been one of the players that has developed the most in the last 12 months. I've been tracking these guys for a long, long time. I'm very excited to continue tracking their careers as they're in the NBA. But I know where this guy was 24 months ago. I know where he currently is. And it's a night and day difference. And because of that, I think that that's something you can really bank on and say, look, this guy's going to continue to get better and better and better. And if you trust Rick Carlisle as your coach and some of the development uh, that he's overseen in his career... Leonard Miller is going to be one of those examples that like, even though he's pretty good right now, I think he could be a huge steal 17th overall, uh, just with the traits and the physicals that he possesses. Uh, he could be a very intriguing player for sure. Pick 18, the Miami Heat. Now here at this spot, of course, more focused on the NBA Finals right now than they are draft workouts, but it will be important for them to find a good player, and they actually take a big upside swing here on Keontae George. For all the same reasons I talked about Nick Smith Jr. kind of having an up-and-down freshman season, Keontae George didn't necessarily deal with injury 
but he just kind of dealt with being on a weird Baylor team. They had a lot of guards. Their front court was a little so-so this year, which is kind of atypical for a Scott Drew team, for a Baylor team. And I think at times, Keontae George was a little, I would say, overtaxed with being the offensive creator, the offensive engine for the team. And sometimes that became, uh, I think, problematic for their overall ability to win. And I also think that it became problematic for Keontae George's efficiency because he was just not very efficient this year um, for the Baylor Bears. But there were moments that he could not miss. And he's one of those streaky, but when he's hot, oh my goodness, is he on fire type of shooters. And I think that's perfect for the Miami Heat. No pun intended, of course. Uh, But the Heat do just such a good job developing players, specifically guards. You look back at, uh, you know, Gabe Vincent, where he was years ago and and just Max Struess in general, like they they do a good job developing players. That isn't groundbreaking analysis. You guys know that the heat just find and produce talent. And sometimes it's undrafted talent. Sometimes it's second round talent. Sometimes it's talent you've never heard of. And the scary thing is here, we're giving them a kind of high profile, big name in Keontae George, somebody who people thought coming into the year could be a top 10 pick. I don't think his freshman season really panned out that way. I think there's a lot of teams that would consider him from 11 to 18, though. It felt like almost every single team was like, ooh, I kind of think, but no. I kind of think this, but no. And ultimately with Keontae George, I had him fall just a little bit. I know some people are going to be like, whoa, 18th overall, you think he's going that low? I I think this is kind of like closer to the floor for him for where he could go. Realistically, I could see him going in a variety of different spots. It's just about finding the one that you're like, yeah, this is the one I feel most confident in. And in this mock draft, that's when I landed on Miami. 19th overall, we have the Golden State Warriors, and I landed on Chris Murray for them because, one, they have a very good scouting report on his twin brother, Keegan Murray, after their first-round series against the Kings, where I think Keegan Murray had a pretty decent rookie uh, season when it comes to the playoffs. Now, obviously, the regular season, he was fantastic. Keegan Murray uh, filled it up all year, and I think for the playoffs, usually rookies get phased out quite a bit it's just a different ball game and a lot of high leverage basketball that typically means rookies don't play as much Keegan Murray was still worth having on the floor now at moments Mike Brown I think had to take him off the floor and he did a pretty good job managing that throughout the series Uh, but Keegan Murray uh, he's not Chris Murray listen Chris Murray's not as good as Keegan Murray as a a player because I think he just is going to pay off a little bit less of those three-point attempts Keegan shot over 40 percent from three this past year now that's partially a, a byproduct of Uh, Kind of the players he had around him, Sabonis and Fox, both two good assisters when it comes to three-point shooting because Fox able to get downhill so frequently. Sabonis, one of the best dribble handoff bigs in the league. They do it differently, but they both help three-point shooters in a variety of ways. And for Chris Murray here going into Golden State, you're going to have that, but kind of in a different sense. You're going to have some post-split opportunities where you get open shots generated for you. Of course, the Steph Curry high pick and roll is going to probably put a lot of pressure on a defense and open some things up for open looks. And Chris Murray's going to pay off a decent amount of them. He's a little bit more streaky. His sophomore season, he shot about 38% from three. This past year as a junior for Iowa, shot about 32% from three. It's been a little up and a little down at times. Now he was still very productive, averaged over 20 points a game as a junior. And I think he is a good player. He's got the frame. He's got the size. I think he's smart. I think he has good instincts off the ball offensively, which is all the reasons that Golden State takes him here. Not to mention Draymond Green's pending potential free agency. Not that I think he's necessarily going anywhere, but I think it's something to monitor at least. And for Golden State, this will be their first draft without Bob Myers in a long, long time. We'll see what they use this pick for. Could be a trade. But if they sit here and they take Chris Murray, I think it's a pretty good selection for them nonetheless. Number 20 now, we have the Houston Rockets at this spot, and I really wanted to mock Jet Howard here because I think Jet Howard to Houston is a real possibility, but a player slid down the board just a little bit more, and I think it's a testament to how strong the guard class is this year. There's a lot of good guards, whether that's Scoot Henderson, Amon Thompson, Kobe Bufkin, Kaysen Wallace, Anthony Black, the list goes on. Nick Smith Jr., Keontae George, there's a lot of talented guys, and because of that, this guy fell a little bit further than I wish he would have in Jalen hood Shafino from Indiana, who is just a, a really good player. He's a very smart, intuitive player, especially given his age as a true freshman. I think he had a really nice season for Indiana. As a decision maker, does an okay job. At times, I think he gets in his own head and, and makes up his mind a little too quickly and says, instead of taking what the defense is giving him, I think he kind of settles on, a, I'm going to look for my shot here or I'm going to pass, 
which I think is going to be an area for him to grow in. But nonetheless, I think Houston, we already addressed wing with Brandon Miller earlier on. I don't think that Big's necessarily in the cards here for the Rockets. I think they're going to use some of their free agency cap space to do so. So instead, it's going to be about developing a guard. And I think one rule of thumb, when you're drafting a point guard, you typically want to be one or two years ahead of when you actually need them to give you minutes because it usually takes a pretty long time for guards to impact winning in a positive way. I think Hood Shafino is a little bit more NBA ready than others would give him credit for. But I still think giving him time to kind of wait in the wings a little bit, probably see him in the G League just a hair, giving him some good reps and actual um, on-ball like kind of assignments and roles, especially if James Harden's there in Houston, he's not going to see as many minutes in year one specifically, but I think he has the tools to grow into a really good floor general decision maker who also has the ability to knock down shots. I think he's just flat out a good player. You could argue a lottery grade for him. I wouldn't necessarily push back. In fact, there's been players who have been drafted already in this mock that I prefer Jalen hood Shafino over, okay? At some point, I'm going to post my final big board. I'm very excited for that. Um, I'm currently in the process of like drafting up my final draft guide, uh, which is going to be completely free for you guys to read. I'm not going to do what other uh, draft companies, quote unquote, do uh, when it comes to selling their draft guide. I think that for you, I would just want you guys to be able to read it and, and share it with you guys. So we'll see exactly when I get that out. But Hood Shafino is a player I do like, and I think Houston's getting a, a huge steal here at this spot. 21. Remember, we have the Dallas Mavericks now on the board with this. Uh, selection. They also have 22, the pick right after this one. And with pick 21, and now the opportunity to grab two first round players. The first one I'm going to grab is a big man for them. So I think this is a massive need for the Dallas Mavericks. Just like I talked about with point guard though, I think for centers, you really need them to have one or two years to develop before you're really going to rely on them as a 20 to 30 minute a game guy. Noah Clowney is probably going to get thrown into the fire here a little bit. Now, maybe they play with Maxi Kleba. We'll see what happens with Christian Wood if he's back in Dallas or not. I'd be kind of surprised if he is, but I'm not like completely 100% certain that he won't be uh, at this point of the process. And Noah Clowney, maybe he does have a little bit of time to develop and maybe he's not thrown in the fire right away. But I realistically could see the Dallas Mavericks relying on him by December and saying, look, Noah Clowney, we need you. And he's a modern big. He can drive the ball. About half of his uh, shots this year came from behind the three-point line, which is a testament to the way Alabama plays offensively. Uh, and I think Noah Clowney is a player who really could have a nice impact long-term for Dallas, kind of spacing out the floor. Luka Doncic is one of the best drivers of the basketball in the game. Of course, Kyrie Irving, you think about his patented layup package and his ability to, you know, kind of go up and under acrobatic style. I think that Noah Clowney's ability to stretch the floor would be good. He's also a good quality rebounder, which I think Dallas badly needs. Uh, I just think back to their playoff run when they went to the Western Conference Finals and how in round one, <clears throat> Rudy Gobert just dominated that team. Uh, with massive performances on the glass. And I think the Mavericks, since then, they just, it's been such a glaring need that I'm surprised they haven't really addressed it up to this point, even. But now Noah Clowney is going to be a really nice addition for their team long term doing so. And then they're going to follow it up at pick 22 with a big time swing on upside with Dariq Whitehead, a player who was the national player of the year at the high school rank last year for Montverde Academy. He's dealing with a foot injury. Uh, for his pre-draft workouts, he's actually been mostly just studying film and kind of going through film study with teams and, and talking about kind of where his rehab is at. He's been getting checked out by team doctors. He hasn't been, of course, putting on workouts, but there is reports right now, according to Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN, that Derek Whitehead will be ready for training camp, which is a good sign. And I think he's a really talented player, shot over 40% from three this past year. I think he's a very efficient shooter. And for me with Dallas, two things I was looking to address was first of all, rebounding. And then I was going to look for shooting upside. And I thought with pick 10, I can't grab both of those things realistically, which is why I thought the trade down situation did make sense for them. We found Noah Clowney, who's a rebounder, can also knock out, knock down perimeter shots which works because you get him at 21, but then you also get a shooter who I think can do other things as well. I think he's got a, a surprising amount of athleticism. Doesn't always show it, doesn't always need to, but when he's healthy and when he's right, he does have a pretty good strong vertical. He can jump in traffic, which I think is the most important thing is the functional athleticism that you actually see show up on film. 
And then outside of that, he's just a, a player who plays with tremendous balance. He's a very good shooter of the basketball, not only just on the normal catch and shoots, uh, catch and shoot opportunities, which he's going to get a lot of playing next to Luka and Kyrie Irving, but also just the fact that he's a, a player who running off of staggers and pin downs, he can do a lot of nice things. And because of that, this would open up Dallas's offense in a variety of ways. If Jason Kidd's smart enough to actually figure it out. Moving on to pick 23, we have the Portland Trailblazers now at this spot. This pick comes from the New York Knicks. And here with this selection, I kind of pivoted between a few different options, but I ultimately landed on Jet Howard, who I referenced as a potential option at pick 20. The Blazers, remember earlier on, I went with Amon Thompson for them. And we're kind of grabbing another player with a kind of unique handle, decent size to him, and really the typical Michigan Wolverine thing from recent years and recent drafts is connectivity. They do a good job moving the ball. They're all pretty high IQ players, at least the ones who play for Jawan Howard frequently. They all have a good, strong understanding of what does NBA offense look like? What should it look like? What's my role on the team? And am I going to be a selfish player? Or am I going to make the extra pass to an open shot? And Jed Howard does that a lot. And because of that, I think he can actually crack into the rotation pretty quickly for Portland if they were to be the team to select him. I think he would play decent amount of meaningful minutes. Now, it's not like you're going to rely on him for 25 minutes a night, but could he play 10, 15 minutes a game? And will he flash some really positive things? I 100% believe so. I think this is uh, a really strong selection for them. They're getting a player who early in the process, some people were looking at as a, a potential lottery pick. You're getting him at 23 here. He's got a pretty good track record of his, you know, kind of development and his just overall standing as a draft prospect uh, through his high school ranks and everything. And I, I believe because of that, Jed Howard's going to be a, a really nice addition here for Portland at 23. 24 now we have the Sacramento Kings. And for Sacramento, you could look to add to their offense, which was the number one offense in the league according to offensive rating and just the overall production that they put out this past year. Or you could address the defense, which was a little so-so. Now they, I think in the playoffs, stepped up big time defensively outside of game seven, where Davion Mitchell, for some reason, only played eight minutes. I wasn't exactly sure as to why that was the decision Mike Brown made. But overall, Sacramento still, I think, in a very good spot. I think they had a fantastic season. They're hoping to build off of it. And I think they do have to get a little bit better defensively with another defensive option in the build, in the building. And I think Ryan Rupair is the player that can do that. Very active hands, can pick up 94 feet. He's got quick feet. He's a big time hustle and energy guy. Uh, good effort. And I think offensively, you have a framework to work with. He's lengthy. He's flashed some things. He can put the ball in the deck a little bit. Now, don't ask him to do it with his left hand. It's going to go a little south for you if you ask him to do that. But in transition, he attacks advantage well. He knows how to get to the rim. He's got good length and athleticism, about a seven foot two wingspan. And he can get downhill quickly. So if you're looking at a transition player, which works really well for Sacramento because they play so fast with such a high pace, I think he would be a really nice fit next to De'Aaron Fox. And out of the way that they play out of the high post with Sabonis, I think that if you're asking a repair to just be a cutter, year one, I think he can fit very well with Sacramento because they have the other offensive pieces around him to kind of mitigate some of his weaknesses, which is why I really like this fit. I've mocked this one a ton on the channel so far this year. And I think realistically, Rupert can have a nice high impact for this team which, without being too problematic for them early in his career. Moving on to pick 25, we have the Memphis Grizzlies now at this spot. And for Memphis, of course, there's all the concerns around John Morant right now. Will they look to trade Tyus Jones? Is OG Ananobi the guy that comes into the uh, fold? What does Dylan Brooks' situation look like this offseason? Of course, we're kind of expecting he will not be back with the Memphis Grizzlies. So let's go out and get a wing-type player, and it's a very active one defensively, specifically around Brandon Pajemski. For the most part, my draft analysis has kind of centered on his offensive game because he's a very good shooter, can handle the ball. But I think in this video, I want to talk more about his activity level. I think he's just flat out a player that wants the ball more than other people. Uh, and you might say, well, is that really a, a skill or a trait? It's a trait. It's not as much of a skill, but it plays itself out as a skill. Think about how Josh Hart rebounds the basketball and how many second possessions he generates for his team. Brandon Pajemski is going to do that a little bit now. He's a little bit less athletic, I would say, than Josh Hart. But I think he's got that kind of want to to him. 
And I think that's a great thing to have. And uh, he shows that not only on the glass where he averaged about nine rebounds a game for Santa Clara, but also defensively. Uh, he played in a lot of two, three zone setups for Santa Clara, but I think that did teach him a lot of things about how to kind of hedge and stunt at a, a driver of the basketball without kind of sacrificing your own positioning. And he does a pretty good job of that even in man-to-man -man assignments. He just, he makes winning plays. And for Memphis, if they do keep the pick, you're looking to kind of help your half-court spacing and offense. Pajemski checks, checks that off for you. But then if you're also looking to kind of keep some of that defensive identity, somebody who just wants to go win and wants to impact the game positively, Pajemski's going to fit in just fine there in Memphis. Number 26, now remember the Lakers moved down after their trade with the Indiana Pacers. And I actually, at this spot, having have them going with Ben Shepard from Belmont. Welcome to the first round mock here, Ben Shepard, who is a pretty unique player and somebody who has been a big riser throughout the end of this process, where every single year we see at least one or two guys kind of be the players that ascend boards, all of a sudden, they're jumping up into the first round conversation. They go way higher than anyone originally expected. And Ben Shepard's been that for me. He's got a pretty good frame to him. But specifically, if you're looking at the skill set, he can handle the ball a bit for you. He can knock down open shots. He's a strong, competitive player who had a really good season for Belmont this past year. And I think at the NBA Draft Combine, really started to open up eyes for everyone that was able to get their eyes on him and, and just really impressed a lot of people in ways that I don't think a lot of people were expecting necessarily. And the Lakers, after moving down from 17, they moved back to 26. They also still have pick 32 to work with. They get a player who they're pretty comfortable as a contributor as early as next season. And I think if you are going to look to continue building around LeBron James and Anthony Davis, your window is now. And Ben Shepard is a player that I think can help them now. And that's really the important part of this process for the Lakers. Would it be fun to take an upside swing on somebody? Yes, it would be. But again, we talked about the importance of getting young depth. Ben Shepard, I can see having a, a seven or eight year stretch in LA with the Lakers, and he's ready to start that stretch right now, which is really the whole point of making a selection here. If you're trying to win again around LeBron James and his current age at 38 years old. Pick 27, the Charlotte Hornets now on the clock. This pick comes from the Denver Nuggets. And the Hornets, earlier on, remember, we went with Scoot Henderson. We're going to complement that here with another just talented player in Bryce Sensaba, who's a big, strong, physical guard. Now, he's not massive in terms of height, but he's got a really good amount of muscle to him. He's very uh, strong, and his ability to play through bumps and contact is very impressive. Now, athletically, he's not insane, and there is some concerns about his defensive prowess. Charlotte, I think, is still taking a long-term approach here, and I think that realistically... We haven't seen James Booknight necessarily pan out. Bryce Sensabaugh is maybe the Booknight replacement. I really like Booknight coming out of his draft. Uh, just didn't really hit as much as I was hoping he would. Uh, but here for Charlotte, 27th overall, I just feel like you can talk yourself into this with the skill set that he possesses, specifically out of triple threat. He's a very good mid-range shot maker. And I think he gives Charlotte something they don't have right now. We talked about LaMelo Ball and kind of his reliance on touch and three-point shooting. Scoot Henderson can get to the rim uh, and kick out for others. Now they're adding somebody who can score in the mid-range. P.J. Washington does that, but in a very different way, kind of as a post-up, face-up player. Bryce Sensabaugh can do it off of dribble drive penetration and, and one dribble pull-ups. And I think it gives them, uh, again, another play style to maybe see what works and what doesn't. They're trying to figure out their roster right now. And just if you're going off of talent, Sensabaugh, you could argue as maybe the most talented player on the board at this point. Pick 28, we're back to the Utah Jazz. And I'm going to tell you right now, I strongly consider Jordan Walsh because I wanted to go three for three on Arkansas Razorbacks here for the Utah Jazz. But ultimately, I could not land on that. So instead here, I went with Maxwell Lewis from the Pepperdine Waves. If you look back at Danny Ainge's draft history, Really, the reason I was considering Jordan Walsh is because he either goes with somebody who could become a really good point of attack defender that typically doesn't, or he goes with somebody who has intriguing shot making potential. Think back to an RJ Hunter, and you think back to maybe a Gershon Yabusele. He's made picks like that in the past, and I hope you see the two archetypes I'm kind of talking about. I decided to go with Maxwell Lewis here because earlier on we went with Anthony Black, who I think defensively kind of checks off some of those boxes, and Nick Smith Jr. Uh, yes, he does check off some of those shot making boxes, but if you're unsure about one of them, I think Nick Smith Jr. is the one to be a little bit less sure about. 
which means let's go with another shot making upside guy because if one of the two hit for utah they're in a really great spot moving forward and you're kind of doubling your chances of one of these two sticking long term for the utah jazz maxwell lewis he was really productive for the pepperdine waves now they weren't very good um and i think there are some flaws to maxwell lewis's game that people haven't talked about as much and for me i'm a little bit lower on him as a prospect just in general but i do think that realistically you look at his ability to score and that should be the number one concern here because so if you're at 28 if you're looking for upside like i think utah could potentially be doing this is a really strong pick if you're if you're looking for like safe i thought about andre jackson jr from uconn i just i don't know if the, how that moves the needle for me if i'm utah as much like yes it does help but i'm just like unsure about does that change my future very much and the answer to me for that was no for this mock but i i do know just in general i like the idea of getting like players you are pretty confident are going to be good impactful players i think andre jackson jr will be that i'm less confident that maxwell lewis will be uh but you know with that i, I think utah is in a spot where a swing and a miss doesn't necessarily necessarily hurt them whereas a swing and a hit could definitely move them in a really good direction long term Number 29, the Indiana Pacers back on the clock. Again, remember, they had pick 17 after trading up. They drafted Leonard Miller. At 7, they were able to get Taylor Hendricks. And at 29, I have them landing here on Bobby Clintman. And Pacers fans are going to be saying, holy forwards. And yes, I've drafted you now three forwards, all with pretty good size and kind of deferring skill sets, uh, but all with some decent ball skills, all with some decent shot making. Uh, and just overall... Like Bobby Clintman, probably the rawest out of the three of them. Uh, I think that would be a pretty safe argument, but I think he did flash a lot of different stuff. Now, he only averaged about five points a game this past year for Wake Forest. He hasn't been very productive, but if you turn on the film, you're going to notice in short rolls, sometimes he makes the right read and throws some really nice passes. Uh, he's athletic enough to defend across multiple positions. He rebounds the ball decently well for his size. Uh, and I think just overall, like this is a development thing for Indiana. If you're drafting Bobby Clintman, you're believing that you can advance his game in those areas. And just given the fact of what Indiana has currently on their roster, I just kind of thought, look, I don't need to draft another guard. I feel confident with Halliburton, Nemhard, and Buddy Heald right now. I think that let's just take more stabs at the forward spot. Let's get more big, lengthy athletes on the roster who have some serious upside to them and, and see where it goes from there. And hopefully Halliburton and company can and kind of put them into spots where they're going to succeed early on and, and show some signs of real development over the next couple of years. Then pick 30, the Los Angeles Clippers now on the clock. And with this pick, they're in a weird spot. I've thought about so many different prospects for the Clippers throughout the year. I've landed on CD Sissoko here uh, because I think the Clippers in a spot where a stab on upside's not bad. He's got a lot of traits that are intriguing. He's kind of like an underrated passer in terms of like if you see his highlights, you're like, wow, this guy can maybe pass the ball at like a, a pretty solid level. Now, I think when you watch full games, that doesn't necessarily stick out as much for um, a guy like CD Sissoko, but I think that he's had enough moments that the physical traits and, and some of the skill set that he does possess is interesting. He's got a very good uh, spin move that he likes to go to. Now, you could argue maybe it's a little bit of a carry. Uh, at times, he does definitely carry the basketball. But uh, he's a, a, a good player that, you know, if, if you're bet betting on upside here, if, the, if you're the Clippers, I think there's two trains of thought. You either go with the, like, ready-to-win player who can hopefully step in and help you day one. Uh, but I don't know if the Clippers need that. And if you look at their draft history, like BJ Boston, Jason Preston, guys who were more like, hey, what can they be three, four, or five years from now type of prospects? I think CD Sissoko kind of fits that uh, wavelength as well, which is why the Clippers here probably would look that direction instead of a different one, at least at this point in the process. That's where I'm currently sitting with the Clippers. Hopefully you guys did enjoy this video. Again, if you did, make sure to smash that like button. Subscribe to the channel for more content. Hit that notification bell as well so you don't miss out on future uploads here at Utility Sports. I hope you guys can tell how much work goes into these videos, not only just the actual process of recording and uploading, but uh, you know, kind of setting up the graphics and uh, the animations and, and also just the time watching the prospects. I hope you guys do enjoy all the work that goes in. I have a lot of fun doing it. I love talking about basketball. I'm sure you guys love talking about it as well. There's a Discord link in the description to talk about basketball with a lot of other people who really care about hoops as well, which I recommend going and joining. Again, links in the description for that. And we'll catch you in the very next Utility Sports video.